All right, AP 4-1. This is what we did Friday right before break. Um, most of you kind of consulted my notes, consulted each other. Um, so you may not even need to be watching this, but if you do, I'm going to run through them uh, kind of quickly because there's a lot of good things that are review that are going on in here. So number one was this setup. Um, for this time interval, we were given the velocity, and we were told that the position at time zero was negative four. Question A. Um, when is the particle moving to the right? When moving to the right? Um, well, that would be when v is greater than zero. Okay, so how do I figure that out? Well, I think in class we did a table of values, but I think maybe a, a picture would work uh, if you could do a graph of this. I know you're thinking, how do I graph that? Well, I know what the graph of sine looks like, so ignore the rest of that for right now. But let's, I know what the graph of sine looks like. looks like that. And it reaches a maximum of 1 and a minimum of negative 1, especially when there's nothing out here changing things. That pi over 4 changes things a little bit. Uh, usually, we start over at 2 pi. Um, and we would get to 2 pi if t was 8. So let's call this 8, because 8 times pi over 4 would be 2 pi. And then halfway would be 4. We want to go to 9, so I don't know exactly what's going on at 9, but we're, we're up somewhere. So that's that's where our problem ends. So I don't have to know exactly what it looks like out there, at least not yet. So v is greater than 0. This is the graph of v. And it's greater than 0 from 0 to 4. And from 8 to 9 with parentheses because we don't want to include those points um, because velocity is actually zero at, well, at zero and four and eight. And at nine, uh, that's the end of the, the time. So we don't, I mean, we know what's going on next, but we don't really know what's going on after nine. So we'll just stop it um, at nine. Part B, write but do not evaluate an integral expression that gives the total distance traveled. Total distance traveled. Well, the total distance traveled um, would be the integral of velocity, right? Velocity is derivative of distance. So if we go backwards from that, if we integrate velocity, we would get position. And we're going to integrate from 0 to time. So the integral from 0 to t of sine of pi over 4t dt. And it says write but don't integrate, write but don't solve. So that's our answer, uh, except it said from 0 to 9, so we can put a 9 in there. So the position, oops, that wouldn't be x at 9, that would be x of 9 minus x of 0. So that would be the, the total distance. Oops, the negative one goes there. That would be the distance um, traveled from 0 to 9. Uh, part C. Actually, the reason we have to, back to this one, total distance is always positive. So that would need to be in absolute value. I don't think I had that on the original key. Um, so now that's the total distance traveled. The absolute value makes sure every, everybody's positive. And so it gets a, a, always a positive number there. Part C, find the acceleration of the particle at time t. Well, acceleration is derivative of velocity. So I know velocity. I can take its derivative. That's not even that bad of a derivative. Derivative of sine is cosine. Um, and then chain rule would be times pi over 4. So there's my acceleration. If we want it at time t. So pi over 4, cosine of 3 pi over 4. Uh, and that's a safe stop answer. That's, that's a correct answer right there. Is the particle speeding up, slowing down, or neither? Uh, speeding up, slowing down, remember if speeding up means velocity and acceleration have the same sign, then it's speeding up. If they have a different sign, it's slowing down. 
So I need to know if that's positive or negative. So it's a fine safe stop, but I really need to know if it's positive or negative. Let's see, cosine of 3 pi over 4, that would be right there. So that would be negative. That's kind of all I need to know to answer that question. V of 3, sine of 3 pi over 4. Um, so I'm still at 3 pi over 4. The sine would be positive. So those are different signs. So therefore, the particle is slowing down. Because one's positive. Uh, because the velocity is positive, the acceleration is negative, it's slowing down. Again, the key was wrong on that one too. So I hope you're watching this video and not trusting my rushed key from earlier. Part D, find the position of the particle at time 3. So the position at time 3. Well, if I integrate velocity, I get position. Um, and if I want 3 to be involved, I should go from 0 to 3. So that would be x of 3 minus x of 0. I know x of 0. They told us that was negative 4. x of 3 is what I'm looking for. So the integral from 0 to 3, sine of pi over 4 t dt equals x of 3, what I want, minus negative 4. That's what they gave us. This is a no calculator problem, so I've got to do this um, by hand. Um, so that would be cosine of pi over 4 and negative because the derivative of cosine would be negative sine. And then to undo the chain rule, I need a 4 over pi from 0 to 3. And then I'm going to, um, that would be plus 4, so I'll minus 4. And that would be x of 3. Not quite a safe stop yet, though, because I need to plug in 3 and 0. So negative, actually we'll do negative 4 over pi out front. Let the t off. Cosine 3 pi over 4 minus cosine of 0 minus 4. I don't know what that is, but I don't need to know what that is. That is the answer. That is a safe stop answer. Uh, all right, that took me seven and a half minutes to do. That would be a good um, pre response question on AP test. And again, you have 15 minutes per question on the AP test. So if you felt like I did that fast, um, I did. I did it twice as fast as you would need to do it. So hopefully you would get some of the points. Again, you're aiming to get more than half to get passing. So if you, even if you got most of that, you'd be, you'd be on track to be doing okay. All right, next up was number two. Number two should have been a little bit easier. Maybe not quite easy um, because it is stuff that we just did. picture drawn here. Yeah, you get the idea. It's a semicircle uh, on top of some line segments where capital F of X is the integral from 3 to X of F of, of lowercase f of t dt. And of course that is lowercase f of t dt. Consists of two line segments in a semicircle. Find part A, find F of zero. Capital F of zero. Well, there's capital F. So I'm just looking at this. This would mean the integral from three to zero of F of T dt. Um, again, this is where some of you are going to switch those because you don't like it. Others of you will just go backwards and fix its negative. Either way is fine. Kind of looking to peek ahead and divide this up into pieces here. Um, so that's a half. That's two. And this area is a, a fourth of a circle. So pi r squared over four. Radius is two. So that'd be pi. So if I flip the order around, it would be negative uh, two and a half plus pi. Make sure that negative's in 
outside parentheses so that, that all of that stuff is negative because you were going backwards. Next part, capital F prime of 0. Well, capital F is the integral, so F prime is take the derivative of both sides. Well, the derivative of the integral cancels each other out. So capital F prime is little f. So capital F prime is little f of 0. So I can just look at the graph, and it's that point right there. That's 3. <coughs> capital F of 4. Um, there was one really similar to this on the test, and a bunch of you missed it because you, I guess, forgot that that was underneath the axis. And so that area would be negative 1 half. Part B. Find all relative minimum values. Relative minimum values of f. Well, I can answer that without knowing anything else about pictures, equations. I, the relative minimum of f is where capital F prime changes. Let's see, a minimum would be changes negative to positive. <coughs> now, we already said that F capital F prime is equal to lowercase f, so I don't need to say it again. But if you want to make a note of that, you certainly can. Kind of help yourself know what you're looking at. So I'm looking for where f changes negative to positive. And I've got a picture. I'm looking for where my picture changes negative to positive. It doesn't happen. So there are no relative minimums. You've seen that kind of thing happen enough to know that, that that's a possibility. Uh, on the most recent test, one of them asked for a slope at a cusp. And so the answer was D and E. And very few people got it. Uh, but some people did because the slope at a at a cusp doesn't exist. And so the AP isn't afraid to ask you questions that don't have answers. Um, so they're testing to see, you know, are you paying enough attention to know what to look for and to recognize what's going on? Justify your answer? Well, I, I justified my answer first, so I knew what I was looking for. Part C, find the x coordinates of the inflection points of F. Okay, so POI of capital F. Again, I can justify this before I know anything else about this problem. Would be where F double prime changes signs. Well, I haven't said anything about F double prime yet. Um, I said F prime was equal to F. Well, capital F prime, lowercase f. So capital F double prime is equal to F prime, lowercase f prime, which is the slope of F. So I'm looking for where the slope of F changes signs. So I'm back at my picture. So the slope, okay, the slope's not defined there, but it doesn't change signs. It's positive, positive. At 0, changes from positive to negative. At x equals 2, there's a cusp. Like there's not a slope defined at 2, but it's negative, negative, so it didn't change. And the slope at 3 doesn't change. It's The sine of f changes, but the slope of f doesn't change. So only at x equals 0 does the slope of f change signs. Part D, write an equation of the line tangent to the point where x equals 2. Uh, I don't like this question because it doesn't say the tangent of what. Tangent to what point? So I, I think it means tangent to capital F. <coughs> um, but again, I'm not sure. It doesn't really say that. But if it means capital F, I need F of 2 and I need F prime of 2. Uh, F prime of 2 is actually easier because that's just lowercase f of 2. So from my picture, that's just 1. That's the, the graph at f of 2 is 1. Capital F of 2 is the integral from 3 to 2 of the graph. Um, so from 3 to 2, I'm looking at my picture. This is area under the curve is 1 half. 
but it's backwards, so it's negative 1 half. So my point is 2 comma negative 1 half, and my slope is 1. So y plus 1 half equals 1 times x minus 2. Right. Again, that one took it took me seven and a half minutes or so. Uh, I think that's that's uh, again you you'd have 15 minutes to work that problem. So hopefully you get most of those right because that most of that should have been um, familiar stuff to you. Number four. Okay, this one gets a little bit crazy with calculator. Um, on a typical day, Pike Mountain snow on Pike Mountain melts at. So M for melt, pi over 6, sine of pi t over 12, and add snow based on this polynomial here. Now again, it's with calculators, so I don't... I, I, I need to make sure I know I show what I'm doing, but I, I, if the calculator can do it, I need to let the calculator do it. M and S both have units in inches per hour. Inches per hour. And T is measured in hours. From 0 to 6. All right, at time equals zero, the mountain has 40 inches of snow. Okay, so at t equals zero, um, snow is 40 inches. I got to be careful though; that's not the same as this snow because this snow is a made snow, a rate that's being added. So that's not the same s. Part A: How much snow will melt during the six-hour period? Indicate units of measure. Well, the integral of a rate is the amount. So it wants to know how much total will melt. So I'll integrate the melting rate, and that will give me the total amount. So I'll integrate m of t. And it says over the six-hour period, so from 0 to 6. And I can leave that as my answer, because m of t is defined. I'm going to use this in the calculator. And so I can get an answer and be done. I don't have to show anything else. So I'm going to go grab a calculator real quick and show you what that looks like. All right, got my calculator magically appeared here. So I'm going to put m of t in for y1. So pi over 6 times sine of pi x over 12. I'm going to go ahead and put it in as y1 because I know I'm going to be using this uh, several times in this problem, so I may as well put it in as y1. Or y2, I'll put um, the snow making equation in there 0 0.006 x squared minus 0.12x plus 0.87. Whoops. Plus 0.87. And what I'm also going to do, so I don't get confused later, is I'm going to I'm going to label this y1 and y2 um, on my paper. I can do this on an AP test, and then if I use y1 and y2 later, I I can use those later because I've said what they are, and so that might be helpful later. Um, maybe not your choice, but I think it's helpful because then if you just start using calculator jargon, you're okay because you've said what Y1 and Y2 are. Plus, it's just going to help you keep them straight. All right, now I want to do this and show you kind of a different way to do it that maybe we've not seen before. So math 9 you're familiar with, 0 to 6 you're familiar with. I want to integrate M of T, which is Y1. So I'm going to go get Y1. It's one of the vars, one of the variables, one of the y variables. It's a function, y1. So I'm going to integrate y1 
from 0 to 6. Let the calculator do the work. And that means the total melted was 0 0.043. It did say be careful about units. Um, indicate units of measure. Well, m of t was in inches per hour. dt is in hours. So the hours would cancel, and that would be in inches. Well, that also is a good confirmation that we got the at least on the right track there. Part B. Write an expression for I, the total number of inches of snow at any time t. Okay, so I is how much snow there is. Um, so I think I would... I've got to have the amount that's snowed minus the amount that's melted, but this is an amount and these are rates, so I need to integrate the rate from 0 to t, integrate the melting rate from 0 to t, Um, and then this is where it told me they started at 40, so I just need to add 40 to that, and that would be my that would be my expression. I think that's all it asks. Write an expression. Done. So I don't have to evaluate that. I don't have to do anything else with that. I mean, I might later, but that's it for Part B. Part C: Find the rate of change of the total amount of snow at time three. Well, this was the total amount of snow, so the rate of change of I, so that would be calculus rate of change, that would be, if it doesn't specify, you're in calculus, so it means calculus rate of change, otherwise it would have said average rate of change. So I need I prime. So if I take the derivative of the integral, I'm back to S, so S prime of T. Again, the derivative of the integral is m prime of t, and the derivative of 40 is 0. Uh, that's not what it asks exactly. It wants i prime at 3. So that would be s prime of 3 minus m prime at, whoops, at 3. But I already have those in my calculator. So math. Not 9 anymore because I want derivatives. Math 8. So I want the derivative of, of s is y2, so I better be careful here, at x equals 3. Pretty cool. I've not used that function before, I don't think. So that's, that's ds dt at x equals 3 and I guess I could just go minus math 8 this one will be y1 so variables y variables y1 also at 3 press enter And so negative 0.086, always three decimals. And that's not what I got. Why is that? Oh, shoot, I messed this up. I think I said it. I just wrote it wrong. The derivative of the integral is right back to the original. So I messed that up. I hope you watched long enough to get here and realize that this is not right. I don't need that, that derivative sign on there. I prime is just s of 3, the rate minus the rate, which makes this even easier on the calculator. I didn't need to do what I was doing. Oops, not mode. Um, I can go to vars, and I want to do y2 at 3, so it recognizes function notation. So s is my y2, so y2 at 3 minus, now I want y1 at 3.
and make sure I'm in. Uh oh, that's a problem. It also means my other answer was wrong because I need to be in radians for this to work. Get a different answer. 0.194 and that would be in inches per hour. I prime at 3. Which means my previous answer for A was probably wrong. I thought that looked small. Um, when you put it in the calculator in radians you end up with 2. 2 inches. Sorry about that. I thought bad mistake, the radian degree thing. Um, back to this, showing your work. Like This is showing your work. Like You've just said what S is, you've said what M is. You don't need to show plugging it in. You have a calculator. So you know, showing your work is a little less stringent when you have a calculator. They know you have a calculator. Uh, use it and, again, know that they know that you've got it and you're using it. Part D, for what time T is the amount of snow a maximum? What is the maximum value? Justify your answer. So there's a relative max when I prime changes from the max would be positive to negative. So I want to look and see where I prime changes from positive to negative. And then I need to check my endpoints, although I kind of have the endpoints already because they told us um, that the initial was 40. And we don't know what the other endpoint is, so we'll just we'll go with that for now. Um, so when I prime changes, well, I prime, we already said was S of t minus m of t. Well, I can graph that because I already have those. S is y2 and m is y1. So here's another fun calculator trick. I want to graph y2 minus y1. So vars, oops, wrong one, vars y2 minus vars y1. That's what I want to look at because that is i prime and I want to see where that changes positive to negative. Um, my window, oh goodness, I'm, I'm only caring about 0 to 6. So I don't know what I was doing beforehand, but I don't need all that. Um, I'm only caring when it's negative or when it changes sign, so I'll just go negative four to four on my scale. So I'm looking for when it goes positive to negative. Okay, so only one location, wherever that is, I'll use the calculator to find that. Um, and that's my only relative max. So if my graph only has one relative extrema, and it's a max. It means my graph looks something like that. So that relative max is the act is the absolute max. So I, I kind of don't have to worry about the starting and finishing values right now. So that happens at. And again, I can just say where it happens at because I'm, I'm told them what I'm looking for, and the calculator is doing the work. So second calc zero. Left bound, right bound. Uh oh, I gave this a wide range to look through, but that's okay. You can figure it out. So it happens at 4.4.2405537 hours. Don't round to the end, so keep all that stuff in there. But what I need then, so that's when it happens. That's when the max is. But it also says what is the max. So I need I of 4.240 dot dot dot. You can use dot dot dot. That just means that you're using all of it in the uh, 
in the equation. Now I've defined what I is. I did that in part B way up there. So this is going to be another calculator thing. Math 9. So the integral from 0 to, wait a minute, I want to make sure I get this correct. So before I do anything else, if I press x, it'll use the last x value, um, which is the 4.24. I want to store that as a, so I don't have to type it in the whole time. Store as a. So now anytime I use a, it's that value. You don't want to store it as x because x is doing a variable thing, so you don't want to mess with that. All right, so math 9 from 0 to a of, I'm going to do the snow minus the melted, and then don't forget the plus 40. So the snow was y2, so vars y2. So that's how much snow was added between 0 and 4.24 hours minus the amount that was melted math 9 from 0 to a of y1 but then don't forget to include the 40 that we started with And you don't have to show any work on that because your calculator did all the work. 41.652 inches of snow at 4.24 hours. That one was a little harder. That one took me almost a full 15 minutes, but I also had some missteps in there. And I was slowing down to show you what the, what the calculator was. So, um, and again, Hopefully that would be the long one on the test and it's not 15 minutes per problem. It's 30 minutes for two and then 60 minutes for four. So it's an average of 15 minutes per problem. So you, you know, can do make up time on one and use it on the other, uh, just like any other test. All right. That's it for um, going over the AP stuff, or the AP questions from 4-1.